This is But Why, a podcast for curious kids from Vermont Public. I'm Jane Lindholm. On this show, we take questions from curious kids just like you, and we find answers. This episode is being released right at the end of 2022, so we thought it would be fun to look back at some of our favorite episodes of the year. So I'm joined by... Me! Hi, everyone. It's Melody. And yeah, we figured you might not have caught all of our episodes this year. So this is a chance for us to give you a chance to hear some new things. Let's just dive right in. We're going to share a little bit of four different episodes. So Melody, do you want to start? Yeah, so one of my favorite episodes this year was one called Why Do We Have Friends? And one of the things I liked about this episode was that we asked kids to answer the question and we heard from dozens of you about how and why we have friends. And I love to hear all of your responses and I love getting kids into episodes. My name is Marnie. I'm five years old and I live in Austin, Texas. And this is how you make friends. We try to find somebody that we want to make friends. We say, hello, can I be your friend? My name is Connor. I'm seven years old. I live in London, Ontario, Canada. My, my advice about friendship is to choose someone who do, likes to do the same thing as, as you do. Hi, my name is Layla. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm nine years old. This is how I make friends. First, I say hi, and then I say my name, then I ask them their name. Then I ask them to play, and then if they say yes, we start to play. After a while, I start to talk to them, and then we, and then we just have fun, and that's how I make a friend. I love that episode too, Melody. I really liked hearing kids offer solutions for how to be a good friend, but also what to do when somebody is not being a good friend, because we all go through different stages of friendship with different people. And so it's really helpful to have some strategies for thinking about ways to be a friend and ways to um, maybe deal with people who are not being good friends. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, kids think about friends as much as adults do. So this is actually a good episode for everybody in the family to listen to. And in addition to our kid experts, we also talked to Dr. Fantastic, and she's also known as Eileen Kennedy Moore, and she's written a couple books about kids and friendships. And one of the things I liked about talking to her was that she had a couple really direct strategies for making friends, and I think that's something that's often missing in the way that adults like me and parents who are trying to help, we don't often give kids the exact tools of what exactly to do when making friends. So here's a little bit more of that episode. Hello. My name is Ethan. I'm eight. My question is how to make friends. Why are people usually friendly and how do people know what to say when they're trying to make a friend? That last question was from six-year-old Lila. There are several steps in that. The first thing is that we need to show openness to friendship. So we need to signal that, hey, I'm open to getting to know you and and to maybe starting a friendship with you. We do this by smiling and saying hi. We do it by giving a compliment or doing a small act of kindness for someone. There are thousands of ways that we can signal that, hey, I'm interested in a friendship. Another thing that's important is to pick people who are likely to become friends with us. If you think about two overlapping circles, that overlap where one one circle is you and the other circle is the other kid, that overlap in the center, that's your common ground. That's where friendships begin. If you really don't have much in common with another kid, you're probably not going to become friends with them. Another thing to keep in mind is that kids make friends by doing fun things together. So think about what you like to do that you could do with other people and go do it. Invite them. A lot of times kids are very scared of inviting somebody because they're like, oh, I don't know them that well. I can't have them over. That's backwards. Invite them over and then you will become closer. You don't have to wait until you're close and then invite them over. If you've had fun with the kid one time, great. You know him well enough to get together and and maybe build the friendship. You might consider asking the other person to do something with you, like go play on the swings or something you think you'd both enjoy as sort of a start of a way to ease into friendship. 
you know, there's also a difference if you're asking one kid to play with you or a group of kids to play with you. And Dr. Fantastic has some strategies to think about when there's a group of kids that you're trying to get to know. We are more likely to be successful joining a single kid or a group of four or more on the playground. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So it's not that you can't join a group of two or three, but often those are more close knit and less open to somebody joining them if you don't know them well. A single kid is, they want to play with somebody. They're, they're definitely open. And a group of four or more, well, it's, it's, it's kind of big and there's plenty of room to join. Another thing that's really important for kids to know is that there's a very specific set of steps for how to join a group of kids at play. I really like the way you said, hey, do you want to play with me? Because now you're inviting the person. A lot of times, grownups tell kids, go over to those kids and ask, can I play too? Bad idea. Because think about what happens. The other kids have to stop what they're doing, turn around, look at you, decide if they want you to join, and you've just interrupted the play. So from a kid's perspective, that's kind of rude. What researchers tell us is the the way to join a group is two steps. You watch, then blend. So watch what the kids are doing and then slide into the action without interrupting. The way I explain this to kids is it's kind of like merging onto a highway. (laughs) Which they haven't done yet, but they've probably been in the backseat for. But you've probably seen your parents do it, right? And there are two ways to mess this up. (laughs) One is your parents could just sit there on the entrance ramp watching the cars go by and oh, you never get where you want to go. The other way is, and your parents would never do this, they could just barge in without even looking and whoof, there would be a big crash. So that's not a good idea either. Just like your parents or your grownups, watch them blend when they get onto the highway. You want to do the same thing. So figure out what the kids are doing. And then you might do the same thing near them. You might, like if they're building something, you might do something helpful, like bring over extra sticks. You might open with a compliment. Or if they're playing a game, watch and figure out which is the losing team, because they're more likely to be open to having you join. (laughs) What do you do if you're shy, if that feels so hard just to even go talk to somebody, let alone suddenly be in their play? Sometimes it helps to just watch other kids doing this. And then you can realize, ha, that is what happens. (laughs) People who are shy tend to focus on how uncomfortable they feel. But what they don't realize is the message they're sending to other people is, I don't like you and I don't want anything to do with you. Think about it. If somebody says hi and you like look away and and don't say anything, the other person's going to say, I guess they don't like me. That's not what you're feeling, but that's what you're communicating. Learning how to say hi is a really important skill. And there are several steps with that. So you look the person in the eye. Or if that's uncomfortable for you, you can look them in the forehead right between the eyebrows. From a little bit of a distance, that looks the same. Then you smile to show that you're happy to see the person. You say hi and you say the person's name because that makes the greeting personal. I'm not just, hi, whoever you are, I don't care. It's like, no, hi, it's nice to see you. (laughs) So that was one of my favorite episodes. Find it in your podcast feed. It's called Why Do We Have Friends? Okay, Jane, what's an episode that you really liked this year? I really liked all of them. So let's just play them all. Oh, okay. Everybody got a couple hours? (laughs) Uh, But I will pick one. I really enjoyed our episode with a researcher named Chris McManus, and it was all about why most people are right-handed and a select few people are left-handed. Do you remember that one, I do remember that. And I also remember that Jane, like a lot of left-handed people, loves to talk about how she's left-handed. So I'm actually (laughs) surprised that we've made it this far into our podcast without actually doing a left-handed episode yet. But we finally agreed and we finally found the right person. It's important, Melody. I mean, you know, tools are made for righties. Um, Sometimes it's hard to do things like use a fancy butter or cake knife because it's not made for a lefty. Or like if you're learning to play the guitar and your teacher is a right-handed teacher and you're trying to play left-handed. I mean, it's complicated. It is complicated. I get it. I have a left-handed kid, so I understand. (laughs) But it's also always made me curious about why are 
there are so many right-handed people and so few left-handed people? Like, why isn't everybody just right-handed or half of all people are right-handed and half of all people are left-handed? And Chris McManus helped us understand a little bit more about that. It's a conundrum for scientists, too. And a conundrum means something that is unsolved, a problem that you can't quite figure out. So here's a little bit of that episode. I think the basic answer is that we're mostly right-handed but and some of us are left-handed because we inherit it that way. So if you have two parents who are right-handed, you're much more likely to be right-handed than if you have two parents who are left-handed. So we inherit something here. There's something in our genes which makes us mostly right-handed. Why we're mostly right-handed is a different question. And it probably comes from the fact that our brain is asymmetric. And so I'm talking to you at the moment with the left half of my brain. And most people use the left half of their brain to to talk. So our brains are very asymmetric. And asymmetric means not the same on either side. Our brains are different on the right and left sides. With the left half being what we call dominant. It's the more important one for language. And where that comes from is the next question, because as always, when you ask why, you can ask why to the next question and why to the answer to that question. And probably in the long term, all of these things go down to the other thing that makes us very different on the two sides, and which we don't think much about, and that's that my heart is on the left side of my body. That's true of almost all humans. Only about one in 10,000 people have their heart on the right side. And probably the fact that our brain is different on the two sides has developed from the fact that actually our bodies are different on the two sides. That's fascinating, because we think of our bodies as looking pretty much the same on both sides. We do think about our bodies being looking pretty much the same on the two sides. And they are on the outside, because if one leg, say, was much longer than another, than the other, you'd run in circles or something. You need to be the same when you're doing things in the world. But look inside our bodies, ask a surgeon about what's going on inside your tummy and your abdomen or inside your chest, and they'll tell you they'll The liver's on one side, the spleen's on the other, the appendix is here, and so on and so on. But when it comes to handedness, a a good minority of people, 10%, that's not nothing. About 10% of us are left-handed. So why? What is is going on there? Why why is anybody left-handed then? If you think about it, there's three possible ways you could be. It could be that half the people in the world are right-handed and half the people in the world are left-handed. Interestingly, that's the way most animals are, but that's not like humans. And of course, the thing that makes people different from um, animals, people do write and animals don't write, but really people speak and use language and animals don't speak and write and use language. I hate to say it, but although all the children listening to this will understand it and enjoy it, The cats and dogs won't understand a word of it, of course, because it's only humans who have language. And that language is, in most people, in the left half of the brain. And so that that means that right and left are different. And then at that point, you'd say, well, instead of being half half of the people are right-handed and half the people are left-handed, why isn't everybody right-handed and have language in their left hemisphere? Why are there any left-handers at all? And the simple answer to that somewhere has to be that there has to be an advantage to being left-handed. If there weren't an advantage to being left-handed, there probably wouldn't be left-handers. Do you have any sense of what that advantage might be? My guess is that left-handers, I think, are much more special. They're what in If you were buying a suit, you'd say they're bespoke. They're tailored for the particular person. They have different combinations of things in their brain because it's not just language which is on one side. There's all sorts of other things on the two halves of the brain. And my suspicion is that left-handers have some things on the right and some on the left, 
and that very often that gives them an advantage. They become more skilled at particular things. And the sort of things which might be the case, there's a suggestion that left-handers are better at music. There's a suggestion that left-handers are better at mathematics. And those are sort of thing, the sort of skills that may be better. They, they may be better at certain sports. And that's the sort of thing that would mean that left-handers would have enough of an advantage to survive, I'm afraid, the very obvious problems of being left-handed. You know, the world is a right-handed world. If you buy a lot of products, you'll find they're not designed for left-handers to use. Uh, a lot of tools and that sort of thing. So left-handers must have something going for them that means that they continue to survive, even though the, the right-handers make it quite hard for them sometimes. That was researcher and author Chris McManus. His book about handedness is a book for adults, and it's called Right Hand, Left Hand, The Origins of Asymmetry in Brains, Bodies, Atoms, and Cultures. And our episode with him is called Why Are Some People Left-Handed? All right, coming up, two more episodes we loved making this year. This is But Why? And today, Melody Baudet and I are sharing our favorite episodes from the past year. Do you have another favorite, Melody? Absolutely. I don't think it'll surprise anyone who's ever listened to this podcast to know that we like animals. And you all <laughs> like animals, too, because you send us so many animal questions. And I really like this question that we got from a kid in Quebec. My name is Jacob, and I'm four years old. Why did pig do this? <laughs> okay, so he wanted to know why pigs go... <laughs> And I love this question because you can take it in two different ways, really. You can explore why pigs make that snorting noise that they do. And you can also wonder, why do we call that noise oink oink? It doesn't actually sound like oink. And I can make a better pig noise than that. So I don't know why when we're talking, we just don't go. <coughs> and so we put that question to a linguist. That's a person who studies language. And her name was Erica Okrent. We are giving a name for the sound, which is, it's a difficult concept because we understand that we have words for things out there in the world. So you see something and you, it has a word, that's a house, or that's a picture, or that's a bag, whatever it is, we realize that the word itself doesn't look like the thing we're talking about. But when it comes to sounds, when we name a sound, we have the expectation that it should sound like the sound. Uh, and in some ways it does that we have a word beep and that kind of sounds like a beep, um, but it's not exactly the same. It's not e or whatever an actual beep <laughs> sounds like because we've given it a name. And when we do that, when we give a sound a name, we are restricted to what our language can do and what it's allowed to do. And there's a million sounds that the human voice can make, but languages only use a subset of those, and different languages use different subsets of those. So English has these sounds, and French has those sounds, and different languages take advantage of different human sounds, and that's what we have to use when we give a name to a sound. So they're going to be different in different languages. So like in English, you might say a bird says tweet, tweet. And in Spanish, you might say it says pio, pio. And you can hear even in the way I'm using my voice and raising it up high, I'm kind of making the sound of a bird, but it's different from those two languages. In, in a case like that, is it mostly just that's what people kind of chose and, and copied each other? Or is that about what our languages tell us we can do as well? Well, we can all, when you're saying it in a more colorful manner and you can say uh, tweet, tweet or cheep, cheep, and you can sound like the bird. But w I can also say, oh, that bird was tweeting all morning, in which case it doesn't sound at all like the, the actual sound. It's now just the label for that thing that birds do. Speaking of birds, let's hear how you talk about birds in your languages. Hi, my name is Janan. In Mongolian, birds say jeev jeev. My name is Luna. I speak Portuguese. A bird says pew pew. We're Chloe, AJ, and Kalia. And in Spanish, the bird says pew pew. 
My name is Ria. In Punjabi, a crow says, gong, gong. It's kind of interesting that crows get a specific noise when for lots of other birds, we lump their sounds together and just say they're tweeting. I asked Erica, if we weren't writing things down, would we need to have words for these sounds? Like, if we were just speaking, I could say the pig went, <laughs> but I don't know how to write. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we would still have those words. Uh, languages that aren't written have names for sounds, too. Because when I'm in a conversation with you, it, it takes a lot to sort of stop and go, <laughs> like, that's not in the normal stream of, of speech, and it takes a little extra effort. And we want to be able to speak in the language we're using and, and stay in that zone while we're talking. So we, it's good to have words that let us do that from within the limitations of the language. Do you think there is a, a named sound for every animal, even animals that don't really make sounds? No, if, if the animal doesn't really have a cultural importance, then we don't really need a, a sound for the sound that it makes. So in, um, in Turkish, they don't have a pig sound um, because in the culture, um, the pig is not in, it's not in farms and these sort of settings that children's books will be about or children's songs will be about um, because it's just not an element of the culture. And we don't have sounds for, uh, you know, what sound does a a sloth make or I don't know I don't know if they even make sounds um, but it's not something that's in the culture as uh, going down to the farm and hear what all the animals say or going into the woods and hearing what the animals say it has to have some place uh, in the culture um, to, to be important enough to have a word to talk about that sound. So, in fact, when we talk about animal noises and we know that word that we know oink means a pig, and if you speak English, you probably know oink is in reference to a pig, that in some ways says a lot more about our culture than anything else. It's what we think is important to name that gets a name for the sound that it makes. Yes, and it's something that's either in the stories that we tell or in the things that we talk about with each other, it's it's got to have a reason um, to be given a word. And that's true, not just for animal sounds, but for everything. We have the words we have because they're a shorthand way of referring to the thing we want to talk about. And different languages have different words that that don't always match, that don't, don't always directly translate from one to the other um, because it's not something you need this abbreviated way of referring to. And that's what a word is. All right. So that was linguist Erica Okren. And also in that episode, we learned about how pigs communicate and what we actually know about the noises they make. And another cool thing in that episode, Melody, was that we asked kids like you who are listening now to send us how you say animal noises in other languages. Like people don't say oink oink if they're speaking Spanish or Chinese when they're talking about the sound that a pig makes. And so we got all of these amazing replies from you. If you're interested, check out that episode. It's called Why Do Pigs Oink? All right, Jane, do you have a last episode for us? Yeah, I do. So this one is not as fun and lighthearted as the animal noises episode, but I, I felt like it was an important one and one that actually is still a valuable thing to listen to today. So toward the beginning of the year, we started hearing from kids who were learning about something in the news and were a little bit confused because a lot of times the news is geared for adults and kids wanted to better understand what was happening. And I'm talking about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which turned into a war when Russia invaded its neighbor at the end of February. So we thought we would tackle this episode and help you understand what was happening. And we talked with Aaron Hutchinson, who's an assistant professor of Russian history at the University of Colorado Boulder. Let's just play a little bit of that episode. Hi, my name is Jedi. I live in Ravenna, Ohio. I just turned 10. My question is, why is Russia attacking Ukraine? Aaron, can you help us understand why Russia is attacking another country called Ukraine? That is a really great question. And um, in order to understand that, we need to go back in history a little bit. 
actually kind of a lot, <laughs> maybe um, we could even go back a thousand years. Uh, I think I'll just, I'll just go back about 400. So this is before the Soviet Union ever existed, but um, there was a country we call the Russian Empire. And in the 17th century, it began acquiring territory that forms today's Ukraine and began bringing new people uh, into the empire. Um, and this is a process that took place in the 17th and 18th centuries. So that's the 1600s and the 1700s. Yes, exactly. So as a part of this process of incorporating this new territory, people in the Russian Empire, especially the rulers of the country, begin to emphasize that the reason why they, they should bring in this these new lands is because the people who lived there, whom we today call Ukrainians, were really part of the Russian people. And so this idea emerged. And um, by the time we get to the 1800s or the 19th century, um, it was that really the official policy of the Russian imperial government that there was no difference between Russian and Ukrainians. Really, they were all part of the same nation. But this Ukrainian sort of national identity didn't, didn't go away. And in fact, over time, it became stronger. But each time Ukraine tried to be independent, it was brought back in to be together with Russia. In the last century, it was one of the republics that made up that country called the Soviet Union. It was, uh, at the time that it existed, it was the world's largest country. But in 1991, the government ultimately began to fall apart. Um, and the 15 different republics, as they were called, that formed the Soviet Union um, became independent. But um, there are people in the Russian government today who uh, see the collapse of the Soviet Union as basically wrong and that Ukraine really should be brought back into um, either incorporated into Russia today or they would like to see Ukraine basically kind of stay very close friends with Russia, the Ukrainian government, as opposed to having more ties and connections um, to Europe and the United States. So, I mean, it's interesting. It sounds like for hundreds and hundreds of years, there's been tension. There's been this conflict about identity and whether they should be together or apart. And and that this is not something new. This is something that's been happening in the, in the region for a very, very long time. Does that sound right? That does sound right. In general, we can say that uh, on the part of Ukrainians, there has been a desire to have autonomy or independence. Um, not all Ukrainians all the time, but in general, we can say this is something that Ukrainian people have sought. Um, but there has been also pressure from um, the Russian government to sort of keep them under their control, kind of inside their state or um, very closely allied or connected to them. So it's a conflict with some pretty deep historical roots. I mean, if I were thinking about it, maybe kind of like uh, what might happen on the playground or in a cafeteria, let's say... I'm Ukraine, and I have been sitting at the same lunch table with Russia for a long time. And sometimes we're really good friends, and we even share our lunch. And sometimes we're not great friends, but we've still kind of been sitting at the same lunch table. But I now want to go over and sit at a lunch table with some other people who have other European country names. Like, I want to be at the same lunch table with more like France and Germany and Poland and the United Kingdom and the United States, even though they're kind of far away. I kind of want to be closer to the United States. And Russia is saying, no, you have to still sit at this lunch table with me. You can't leave that lunch table. And if you go over to that table, it leaves me feeling more vulnerable or like I might not be safe anymore if you're over with those other countries. So I need you here at the lunch table with me. That sounds like a pretty good comparison. And, um, you know, I think part of the reason why uh, Ukraine wants to go and sit at someone else's lunch table is that there's been a long history with Russia. And uh, during the times when Ukraine and, and Russia were very close friends, a lot of bad things happened to Ukraine. <laughs> You know, it's not coming out of nowhere that Ukraine wants to sit at a different lunch table. And Russia might not sit by itself either, right? It might say, hey, China, do you want to come and sit at this lunch table with me? Like, there are different countries around the world that are getting involved in this and see a benefit or a cost to certain ways that this could play out. And so different countries are getting involved, even if they're not Ukraine and Russia, right? Yeah, definitely. There's... um 
different alliances, different sort of um, friendships and groups of friends among countries. And that's one of the reasons why this Russian invasion of Ukraine is so scary to people is that not only is what's happening in Ukraine right now really terrible uh, and a lot of people are being hurt, but um, there is also worries that other countries could be drawn into this conflict as well so that it could become something bigger. But we hope we hope that won't happen. That was Russian history professor Aaron Hutchinson talking to us back in March. Yeah, and it's hard to believe, Jane, that this war is actually still going on and it's almost coming up on a year. Yeah, and it's been obviously really devastating for people in Ukraine, but it's also had effects around the world. You know, people have had to deal with things like rising prices for food and gasoline. And in some cases, people who were fleeing Ukraine, trying to get out of the way of the war, were going to other countries. And so people in other countries were seeing some disruption because of that. And in Russia, uh, people have been dealing with what are called sanctions, where other countries won't provide goods to Russia or won't give give them um, payment for things in the same way. So this is really reverberating or being felt around the world. Talking about war is really hard and it's a challenging thing. And so even as kids, it's important to kind of know what started that conflict and um, to try to better understand what's going on. When we learn about hard things in the news, it's good to have context for what's behind that situation. Yeah, and it's one of my favorite things about making this show is that we get to talk about those really challenging things. And help us all have a little bit more understanding about the world as we move forward. And so I really appreciate that we get to do these kinds of episodes alongside the ones about why some people are left-handed or, um, you know, why we say things for animal noises. I like having that variety in this show. Well, Jane, it's been fun discussing some of our favorite episodes with you. And by the way, we're approaching 200 episodes of But Why. So we have hours and hours worth of episodes for you to listen back to. You don't have to wait two weeks for new episodes to come out. And if you've been listening for a while, you probably already know this. But if you have a question about anything, you can send it to us. Have an adult record you uh, by using a smartphone. There's usually a free voice recording app they can use. Make sure you get right up close to your adult's phone so that we can hear your beautiful voice very clearly. And don't forget to tell us your first name, where you live, and how old you are. And we get something like 60 to 80 questions a week. So unfortunately, we can't answer every one that we receive. But we do listen to all of them and we love to hear what's on your mind. Melody, you want to do the credits with me? All right. But Why is produced by me. I'm Melody Baudet, along with you. I'm Jane Lindholm. We make the show at Vermont Public, and we're distributed by PRX. Our awesome theme music is by Luke Reynolds. We'll be back in two weeks with an all-new episode. Until then, stay stay curious. curious.